reefs are the rainforests of the ocean. Despite encompassing less than 1% of the marine environment, they are home to 25% of all marine life. Species as diverse as fish, mollusks and turtles, to crustaceans, sponges, echinoderms, and organisms so small they are invisible to the naked eye. These biodiversity hotspots that provide a foundation for marine ecosystems across the globe are in crisis, facing an increasing number of threats. With an estimated annual economic value of $375 billion, coral reefs provide food and resources to more than 500 million people worldwide. To lose our coral reefs would not only be an environmental disaster of epic proportions, but also a global economic catastrophe. Hi, this is Sandy with Global Mana. And today we're at the ARC Centre of Excellence for Coral Reef Studies at the James Cook University in North Queensland, Australia. I think one of the biggest global problems with climate change effects on marine ecosystems is the question, where will the fish go? What will be the fate of critical fish populations? And this is most problematic for small island communities. Coral reefs that surround small islands not only provide a critical ecosystem for marine life and support critical populations of many species that are important for the people that are surrounding those areas that rely on fish solely as a source of protein. But coral reefs and marine infrastructure also provide exactly that, a structure. A structure to dissipate a surge of a storm, to protect that coast. If those reefs, if those critical habitats disappear, not only do the fish disappear, but that protective infrastructure that is protecting the land will also disappear. We are emitting more carbon dioxide into our atmosphere than ever in human history. This is about a 43% increase since the Industrial Revolution. And with the amount of CO2 that we're emitting into the atmosphere, the oceans are taking up a lot of that. They're absorbing about a third of all of the CO2. And what this CO2 does to the oceans is it changes the pH. So in the last 250 years since the start of the Industrial Revolution, we've already changed the pH level of the oceans by 0.1. Now this might not sound like very much, but pH is measured on a logarithmic scale. So this is equivalent to a 30% increase in acidity in the oceans. This means that the ocean is changing 100 times faster than any time in the last 20 million years or so. So not only are we making this change, but we're making it so quickly. If we carry on like this, by the end of the century, um, we'll have changed the pH. So we've dropped the pH by about 0.3 to 0.4 units. Now again, that might not sound like very much, but actually, again, because of the log scale, this is equivalent to 150% increase in acidity since those pre-industrial times. So this is actually a big change for animals in the ocean and a really quick change if we think about sort of evolutionary time um, when animals have been used to living in oceans that have been really quite stable for millions of years. And with the increases in temperature, we're expecting anywhere from a two, three, or even four degrees Celsius increase in sea surface temperatures. We're going to see an increase in the intensity of low oxygen events in certain areas around the ocean. And all of this collectively is creating a lot of stress for the organisms that live there. As carbon dioxide dissolves in the oceans, it actually reacts with water. And it reacts to form an acid called carbonic acid, um, which is the same acid that you get in a fizzy soft drink. If you go to the dentist, they might tell you you've been drinking too many soft drinks because your teeth are corroding. So that same process is happening in our oceans with some of our animals that make limestone shells and skeletons. It's kind of like that experiment we used to do in grade school where you put a tooth in a can of Coca-Cola and the tooth dissolves. Anything in the ocean that needs to make a shell it has a lot more trouble doing so if the ocean pH decreases and becomes more acidic. It's exactly like that experiment. 
and the coral is no different. Animals that make shells and skeletons are also really important for humans. So we like to eat oysters and prawns and crabs and things like that. And if these animals are finding it much more difficult to grow and survive and reproduce in these oceans and even to avoid being eaten by other animals in the oceans, then we could see problems in terms of fisheries or potentially for feeding humans in future. Many of these areas that we investigate are already experiencing a lot of stress, not only to warming, decreases in pH, lower oxygen, but also a lot of stress from the coast. Runoff from coastal development, which increases the turbidity of the water. So it's really this collection of all these stressors that are already occurring that are only expected to get worse. For example, on the west coast of the United States, um, there's a lot of oyster farms there. So these shellfish farms are actually seeing recruitment failures. And this is because in this area, there's a lots of upwelling. So this brings CO2 rich water onto the continental shelf and also runoff from land, plus the effects of ocean acidification. So actually in these areas, they're already starting to see problems. We need a better understanding of how animals are using their habitat right now and the conditions of their habitat. Water quality, turbidity, changes in water flow so that we can make predictions as to where those animals could possibly go if their habitat becomes unfavorable as it is already with climate change. All of the marine world is interconnected. So if we lose some of these invertebrate animals that really dominate lower um, trophic levels in our food webs, we're likely to see those kind of knock-on effects at higher trophic levels throughout the marine ecosystem. From a lot of the research we're doing right now, we're looking at what animals have currently, what kind of capacity they have to cope with these changing conditions. But then we're also looking at cross-generational acclimation or preparedness for these changing environmental conditions. So if parents were raised in challenging environmental conditions, for example, elevated temperatures, and their offspring hatch in those elevated temperatures, does that confer some sort of tolerance to those offspring over those two generations? And that's really what's going to be important. We only do have several decades before we're expecting some of these major changes to occur. And if those changes cannot occur, then we can't expect that the populations of fish will be safe from these changes in their habitat. So these are a pair of clownfish, so your typical Nemo, and they make really good fish to work with in the laboratory because they'll breed in pairs. They'll lay their eggs just on the underside of this terracotta pot. So not only can we expose the adults to challenging conditions, we can also rear the babies that hatch from the eggs under those challenging conditions as well. They also have a great image with the public a lot of people want to protect Nemo and have a vested interest in Nemo. Many species will go through several generations in a very short period of time. And so fish provide a really great model to investigate how these critical processes and mechanisms inside their body change as a response to changes in their water quality, say temperature or pH. So we can look at multiple generations within a short period of time to see if those changes are occurring and use that to make predictions as to how these populations may fare in the future. Some other species, however, such as sharks and rays, are longer living species. They take a lot longer to reach sexual maturity. They don't produce a lot of offspring. The offspring then, of course, take a long time to reach sexual maturity themselves. And so we think that sharks, skates, rays, may actually be in more trouble with climate change because not enough generations will have time to go by in time to make those changes and adaptations. We have got a jumping snail here. The jumping snails are quite interesting because they have this rapid response from a predator. We can actually take them in the time machine, expose them to carbon dioxide levels projected for the future. 
So he knows that I've got him and he's trying to flick out of my hand using his special foot. Imagine if he was on the sand now and he was doing that flicking, he can actually move away from predator very quickly. But what we find is that if we take these snails into the future, to the end of the century, we find that their escape behaviours are actually impaired. Many of them don't escape from the predator, and if they do, they take longer to do so. And this is because carbon dioxide actually disrupts the decision making in these animals. So we've already put a lot of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, and this is going to be uptaken by the oceans. So even if we do something now to stop this, we've still got that lag. Coral reefs and marine ecosystems um, in general have got to face all these kind of local impacts from sort of human development, from nutrient runoff from farms for example, pollution in the oceans and also fishing pressure. If we're identifying species that are already in danger or habitats that are already in danger, we need to do everything that we can to make sure there are no added stressors. Animals have this huge capacity for adaptation. They have been sort of coping with changing environments for many millions of years. The challenge now for them is that this rate of change is, is so quick, we've not really seen this before. So my research is really investigating um, whether animals can cope with this level of change uh, and if they can, who might be the winners and who might be the losers in, in the future oceans. If they don't have a reef to support them, they can't just survive and thrive in an area over a, a sandy bottom, for example. If that reef isn't there, then we don't have those fish populations either.